The first lecture we did was mental passing concept. And I said that's very important to, to get across the concept of mental passing. The fact that um, it's library based, it's based on send and receive and collectives. And the SPMD model is the thing which confuses people. People have this idea that they write their program and they imagine that multiple processors are running that program. Well, they're not. You know, they're, they're each processor is running its own copy of that program, which is, a, which is a different concept. And the important point about that is that all variables are private. So you often see people saying, oh, uh, I, want each, I want each process to store its rank. So they'll declare an array rank of size number of processors. So that each, you don't need to do that. The whole point is if you have int rank, every process has its own copy of that variable. Okay, so that's, that, that's an important concept. Then we the basic MPI programs, the way you compile programs, um, hash include, uh, the basic library, the basic um, function prototype. I, said, I only briefly skimmed over the new uh, Fortran interface. I'll probably introduce that. But if you want to use the new Fortran interface, it's just like the C interface. If the C says, C interface says, MPI request request, the old Fortran interface was integer request, the new Fortran interface is type MPI request request. It's just, so now the, the Fortran and C interfaces look identical. The C types are type defs, the Fortran types are Fortran types. So then we did point to point, which is relatively simple, but not as simple as you might think. And quite a few of the questions in the, in the quiz are actually just about point to point messaging. Most times the communicators said the main thing there was this nasty feature, sorry, this unfortunate feature of MPI that, you know, conceptually there are two fundamentally different ways of doing point to point message passing. Synchronous, like making a phone call, you wait for a response, and asynchronous, which is like sending an email or a letter, and you don't wait for a response. And the, the recommended way of sending messages in MPI is MPI send, but unfortunately it can be either synchronous or asynchronous. And because it could be synchronous, which gives you deadlock problems, I recommend that when you write programs initially, when you develop, you develop with synchronous thing. So you write correct programs if you want to break the... So then you have a problem with deadlock, okay? And we saw that in the very simple uh, traffic model, the very basic, almost the most simple thing you can imagine doing, if you try to use synchronous send in that, because of the periodic boundary conditions, you will get deadlock. And non-bottom communication is the way of breaking that. And my model for it, I think I mentioned, with, with, is like a courier. If you phone up a courier and you say, could you please deliver my message? And the important point is they deliver it, but they also give you a, a ticket for the reference number. And you can then later on phone them up and say, you know, has this arrived? Or I'm going to wait for that to arrive. And the important point there is if, you, if there is no copying. So if you schedule a message for delivery, if you do an IS send or an I send, please send this data, you must not touch that data until you've done the wait, until you know it's been delivered. Otherwise, you don't know. It's like it's like putting, saying to somebody, uh, saying to my secretary, which I don't have, but if I had one, saying, hey, look, there's a document there. Could you please photocopy that and deliver it, okay? And then later on, I go and change something. Uh, I don't know. And then later, I say, have you delivered it? Yes. Well, I don't know if he took the, you know, the, the change, the original and the new copy. And the same is true of non blocking receive, MPI I receive. And in fact, in the message around the ring example, if you think about it, it's exactly the same communications pattern as the traffic model. You need two buffers. You cannot do an MPI I send to the right and a receive to the left into the same data. Now, it turns out that probably works, but it's incorrect because if you schedule this for delivery and then you're trying to receive, and the receive might happen before the send happens. So in practice, you can get like double hops. So you need to be careful about that. Collective communications are really the important, you know, really important um, way of, of make, writing simple programs to get good performance. We've talked about things like gather and scatter. You can imagine the traffic model. Um, if you wanted to, to, to distribute the, 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 the road, you, you created the road on a single process, you want to distribute it to all the processes, but split it up, you do a scatter. At the end, you might do a gather to bring it back together. In the middle of the calculation, each process can work out how many cars have moved, but you want the total number, so you do an on-reduce, um, and things like that. And then we went on to what might look, might look like slightly more easy terms, something for virtual volumes and drive data types. This is useful. Um, it has two real uses. One is it, it illustrates the communicator management, so we, we create it on your own communicators there. But in fact, one of the most useful uh, uses of virtual topologies, which actually isn't in the exercise and maybe it should be, is 
to use collective communications on subsets. So my example was doing some of a rows of a matrix. If you're ever going to do a global operation, we must use the collectives. How do I do a collective across, which isn't across everybody? You create subcommunicators and do collectives across those subcommunicators, and they will be optimized. And then derived data types are useful. First of all, imagine the traffic model. If my fundamental object was a vehicle, I had a, I had a structure called vehicle, which had the vehicle type and it, its mass and its velocity and stuff like that. In my program, my, my basic object is a vehicle. I'd like to be able to do MPI send five vehicles, MPI receive six vehicles, okay? Because I can do structure vehicle, why can't I do MPI send vehicle? Well, I can do that by defining the right data type which maps onto that structure. And it's all a bit messy and horrible, but it's all because MPI isn't a compiler. If MPI were a compiler, it could just look at your source code and say, oh, okay, that's what it looks like. But MPI is not a compiler, it doesn't see your source code. So, and the other, the other use of drive data types is to, is to send strided data. So obviously you could always send strided data with a copy. If you want to send the first, third, fifth, and seventh elements of an array, you could copy them into a buffer, send them, and unpack them to the other side. But that's, that, that's ugly, and copying is slow. Um, so in fact, MPI allows you to derive to, to do uh, vector types, which are, which are strided types with gaps. And in practice, where you use those is if you have a 2D data set, one of the, the, the dimensions, be it this one or this one, is going to be non-continuous non in memory. It's not going to be a single block of memory. And so say this one here um, would, might be um, a strided type, you know, if it's got a stride in it. And you do that in real programs quite a lot for sending and receiving boundary data of, 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 um, of, um, um, of, of, of square arrays. So that's kind of motivating what we did. What we're going to do today is this case study, but I've got a couple of other lectures in here that I wanted to do. But the first thing I wanted to do was to do this quiz, which I think is quite fun. So what you need to do is, if you could go to the, um, get a browser up, if you go to course materials, you will see that right near the bottom, if you click on the MPI quiz, you'll be asked for a room name, but that room name is given there, it's uh, HPC quiz. Some of the questions have more than one correct answer. You can game the system because if there are two answers, it will let you select two. It will let you select two answers, maybe select the third one, you see what I mean? You can... So if you don't know, just guess. It, it, of any of the questions, just guess, because it, it, it is completely anonymous. But, Everybody got the mess of in space, but remember, there's more than one answer, so it's also a library for distributed memory part of programming, so you can click one, more than one answer. If there is only one answer and you try and click two answers, it will delete the first one. So you can, you know, as I said, you can game the system somewhat. Okay, so let's do the next one. To run an MPI program requires special compiler, special libraries, a special parallel computer, a special operating system. Now, I should say that all of these, are, in almost all the questions, all the other than the first one, all the answers are perfectly reasonable potential answers for a message passing system. If I said, I've designed a message passing system, does it need special compiler, special library, special power? Compiler? All of these are potentially correct answers for a, for a general message passing system. However, I'm asking about MPI here, okay? So none of the answers are stupid, right? This is, not a, this is actually not an easy quiz at all. Because all these answers are perfectly re there have been message passing systems which required all of these. However, I'm asking about in MPI, what is what is required? And that's true of all the questions. Don't worry if you get the question. They're not trick questions. That's only this one which is a bit of a trick question. But there's only one. For, uh, but I mean they're not trick questions. But it, they, but they're, they're they're testing questions because I said if you hadn't done this course. But you knew about message passing. All of all of the answers would be reasonable. It just happens to be an MPI. They're not all. So everyone got that right. Very well done. So, so this is this is the thing. So, it requires does not require special compilers. Now people often think it does because um, the Cray is a bit weird because you type FTM with time of the bar. But on a normal laptop or system, you would type MPI F90 or MPI CC, and so people think people keep telling you they're using an MPI compiler. They're not really. The important point is that that's just a wrapper. You don't need a special parallel computer because, of course, even, the, even a single core computer can run multiple processes at once. And in fact, that's a very, very good debugging technique. So, so, so the thing which has changed most in the past 10 years in, in parallel computing is that 10 years ago, you really had to have access to a parallel computer to develop parallel code. 
not for the hardware, but just for the software and stuff. Now, if you have Mac or, or, or Linux, um, Unix laptop, you can download all this stuff, and you can develop parallel programs on your laptop. Now, you might say, well, if I run 10 MPI processes on my laptop, I only have two cores, they're just getting shuffled in and out. Okay, so your code won't go fast, and that will go crippling slow. But that's actually a very good debugging technique, because it's absolutely guaranteed. So one of the problems is if you have synchronization issues, in your, if, if, if you've got, this happens with non-blocking communications, if you have synchronization issues in your program, but you just get away with it, you're just lucky that, that on the different, on Archer, all the programs are running at roughly the same speed. So you just, they're sort of in lockstep, so you kind of get away with it. If you run a parallel program, say 10 MPI process on your laptop, which only has two cores, it's absolutely guaranteed that it will be running out of order. And the only way you will have a correct program is if you have, a, have reused your MPI correctly to maintain synchronization. So, so compiling, developing, running on your laptop is a very, very good compiling technique. So the next one, after initiating an MPI program with MPI run minus N or MPI, what does the call for MPI init do? So I've kind of hammered a lot of these points home, so not, maybe not for this one, but for other ones. So, so it's, it's, it's become a bit of a self fulfilling quiz, actually, because these are the things which I, I noticed that I've asked the questions that I used to realize that people didn't understand after the course, but sort of by construction, I've, I've sort of put them into the course. <laughs> So MPI run is a standard, we're using AP run, but MPI run is just a general. MPI exec, MPI exec is a canonical job launcher. So as I said, it doesn't create the four parallel processes. Again, you can imagine mesh part, there's an old mesh bus system called PVM, parallel virtual machine, where this did happen. When you initialize PVM, it did spawn them, but it doesn't. It's actually, the, it, the, your program is parallel from the start. When you do AP run or MPI run my program, right from the start, you are running four parallel processes. And that's why in my Pi example, I deliberately had a print statement before MPI init to make sure that it was clear, obvious that that was happening. It doesn't create the four parallel threads. I'm not, I'm not normally somebody who bothers about terminology. Um, you know, people say GNU, Linux, or Linux, and get them the other set, or internet, or worldwide, web. I don't really care. But processes and threads are, re are very different things. And, People seem to be quite nowadays quite quite lax about it. But threads, threads, threads can share. So so threads can share memory. Processes can't. Threads can. Threads are multiple threads of execution within a parent process. Processes are ring fence programs or applications. It doesn't start the program execution because that's already been done uh, with them. So yes, it enables the four independent program solving with each other. You can MPI run a serial program and just get four copies of it. You don't need to call MPI init anyway. It doesn't mean generally useful, but you can do that. Next question. If you call MPI receive and there's no incoming message, what happens? Again, all of these answers have been correct answers for different message passing systems over the years, but for MPI there's a particular well, one of the many answers. Is some of these answers are true. So Okay, so oh, brilliant. So this is okay. So obviously oh, very good. So yeah, I mean, there are no timeouts. Um, so this is quite a subtle point, but as I said, um, because your MPI processes are running independent, they can run at um, different speeds. And so if you want to know if your program is correct, always think. Imagine that rank three went to sleep for five minutes, which is perfectly possible. Okay, is my program still correct? And the reason why in most MPI programs the answer is yes is that receives are synchronous, they wait. So first of all, it doesn't, it doesn't fail, it doesn't report there's no income message. But you, some people think there should be a timeout. But in fact, I mean, you could write a program where the, math, the, the controller process sends out some work and then issues a receive for the result. And the result might not come in for five hours or ten hours or a day or seven days, you know. So, so, you know, if, if, you, if you put a timeout on a receive, the question is always, what's the timeout? So, you might say, well, there should be a timeout on the receive, because if there's no, if there's no message coming in, clearly there's been a fault. Something's crashed or the network's gone down, but MPI, doesn't, MPI believes that um, the machine is always 100% reliable. So, if you call MPI synchronous send and there is no receive post, what post is what happens? So, people are doing very well on these, but... 
be unfortunate with standard send and MPI send is standard send and MPI send is synchronous send. So because it's synchronous send, the send waits until the receive is posted. Most people now this is a, this is a potential this is a potential way of sending messages, but it's not synchronous send. This is this is not um, thing. So that's so the next one. If you call asynchronous send, MPIB send, and there is no receive posted, which of these are possible? So my answer to this question needs to be wrong, so I'm going to that well. So, so we didn't do asynchronous send, although it's part of some of the exercise, but uh, put that um, in my communicator tag to most of that kind of company to the rest of the company. Most people got it right, but the message is stored in the delivery later on if possible. Did it let you select three options? So apologies, I have updated this question and um, I did it on my laptop and I thought I'd saved it, but it clearly hasn't saved it. So, okay, but so that, that was my mistake. So, so, so the last, but so you're right, the message stored in the later on as possible. And also the program continues to execute files where the message is received. Now apologies because I, I, I did update this quiz this morning, but I must have had some problem on my laptop. It is also possible that the send fails. When can that happen? Yes, so it's actually not a consequence of this. It's just saying, if you call MPI asynchronous send, then the send could fail. So apologies, that was the update I made since last time, but there seems to be something I think problem with my, my laptop. But why would the send fail? Because you, you might have run out of buffer space. But, so MPI B send mandates that MPI should buffer it and copy it. But it's up to you to have given MPI storage with MPI buffer attached. And so it is possible. See, I didn't have that before. So, I, so, so yeah, it's, it's a bit of a trick. It's a trick because because this implies you're thinking about the way it was. Yeah, there was meant, but someone actually said last time, couldn't it fail? I was like, yeah. So I decided, should I either take this option out or leave it in the market? Correct. I thought I'd do it. Because it is technically. The reason it's important is actually, it is actually important. So the next thing. If you call a standard send MPI send and no match and receive, which of the following are possible outcomes? I don't think you can set this quiz up so that it, so it doesn't give away the number of right answers. If you think that, so, so the important point is MPI send can be synchronous or, or asynchronous. Oh, ah, I see what I did. I updated the wrong question. Okay, sorry. Apologies for that. Okay, so that's, I was in a rush this morning. I realized that I hadn't, okay. So that's, uh, okay, I, so I see what's happened. I've got the wrong question. So you would think, apologies for that. You would think that the answer would be the union of the answers for, for synchronous and asynchronous because MPI 10 can be synchronous or asynchronous. But the reason I decided to leave, apologies for screwing that up, that in fact, the thing that it doesn't do is it can't fail because the point is it chooses synchronous and so that it, it doesn't fail. So the right answers are the send waits to the receiver is posted because it could, if it was synchronous, the send waits to the receiver is posted. If it decides to be asynchronous, it's these two. But, but, but it's, the answer is not the union of the two answers from the previous questions because it makes this decision precisely to make sure that the send doesn't <laughs> fail. So I realized what I did in my haste. I, uh, I update. Because you can see the answers to these questions are the same. Oops. The API receive routine has a parameter count. What does this mean? This is an interesting one because. First of all, it's not the size of the incoming message in bytes. It might have been, but MPI tries not to talk about bytes. MPI tries to be higher level than that. So MPI always tries to talk about objects, five integers, six real numbers. You would think it's the size of the incoming message in, in bytes, and in many programs it is. You know, if I'm, if I'm doing boundary swapping here, if I'm sending a boundary from that processor and receiving on that processor, the, the, the send and receive messages are the same size. Okay? But actually it is not. What you're doing, when you receive an, M, an a message in MPI, what you're saying is, I would like to receive a message, and I have reserved N integers for that message for the, for the receive button. You're not saying this, the incoming message will be of size N. Technically, what you're saying is, I want to receive a message from you, and I have reserved N integers space for that message to be stored in. Okay? That's what you're saying in MPI. Now, in many, many programs, of course, it does turn out to be the size of the incoming message. I appreciate that. But actually, the N is not the size of the incoming message. The N is the size of the, the amount of storage you've applied. So then the obvious question is, 
what happens if the incoming message is larger than count? What happens if the incoming message, you, you, you ask for a message of side n, and the incoming message is bigger? What do you think happens? And again, all of these are perfectly, I'm sure there would be message passing systems that can implement most of these in the past, but MPI has it. So I said it might seem it might seem a technical definition, but it, it does actually matter that the N is not the size of the incoming message. The receive doesn't fail. You might the message might be on the available storage. MPI does try and be safe. MPI does try and um, you know protect you from silly mistakes, so it wouldn't do that. So you might think only the first count items are received, but actually that's not what happens. What happens is the receive fails with an error. This is what somebody saw this up. This is one of the few cases where at runtime you get a sensible error message from MPI. It will say incoming message truncated or you know, message too big. I think the reason for this is that you know if, if I've if I've sent you a hundred integers, uh, so some people think that this will happen and then the next receive will match. Some people think of MPI communications being like a pipe, you know, a FIFO, so that basically, you know. That, that you get a, that, that there's data coming down the line. It might be they, they might have set 100 integers and 100 integers, but I could receive them as 50, 50, 50, 50. That MPI doesn't work like that. MPI works on incoming messages matching one to one. And so, if you think about it, this would be a dangerous thing to do because you would have, you know, you would have sent 100 integers, received 50, and then, you know, that's presumably that sounds like an error to me. How could you make sure that you allocate enough space for the incoming message? How could you say, right, I want to receive a message from you, but I don't know how big it is, but I'm going to guarantee to allocate enough space. I covered the next question. No, it's not. Okay. You do probe. So that's why probe is there. MPI probe allows you to say, if I issued a receive here, you know, what message would I receive? And then you could look at that and then say, okay, what happens if the incoming message is smaller than can? The reason I don't really cover it, MPI probe is that, to be honest, if you teach people at MPI probe, they use it all the time, and actually, you only really need MPI probe in fairly restricted situations. So the receive doesn't fail with an error. The first n items are received. So this this allows you. you know, this this means if you've got messages of unknown size, you can bound them. You know that I don't know how many how much data I'm going to get from somebody, but I know it's always going to be less than a megabyte. You can reserve a megabyte of space. And then you can issue a receive, and then if, if it fits, it fits. See, MPI never allocates memory or tries not to. There are various formal statements in the manual, such like the MPI library will use up a finite amount of memory. MPI never allocates large amounts of memory. The memory usage of MPI is bounded in some sense, so it will it will allocate storage for. You know, bookkeeping and stuff, but it won't allocate memory which grows with message size. When the data comes in, it's just a stream of bytes, it's not an array. So, it's, you know, but there is a design, that's a good point. There is a design philosophy in MPI. The MPI will not allocate large amounts of memory. So, for example, you, you might say it, it, if it did that, then you'd be able to do buffered send. You could just do a buffered send and say, well, MPI should allocate the memory for the buffer. It knows how big the message is. Why doesn't it buffer it? Why is it up to me as the user? To give to give MPI the buffer space, or well, the design for obviously by M, behind MPI, and is that its its memory footprint is bounded. The MP, the amount of memory that MPI will use is bounded in some you know, make sure the number of messages won't get through with the size of messages. So that's the MPI does not allocate large amounts of memory itself, or if it does, it does it statically, like it will allocate some space to buffer the. The asynchronous message is if it's using send, but that's that's a bounded amount, that's a fixed amount. If MPI allocated the memory for receives, then it, you, then you wouldn't need the explicit buffer. Then you wouldn't have to buffer attack. So, it's, so the value of count of the receives up there that could happen in in Fortran. It's not obvious, but in C, that's impossible because the count is a is an integer and, and you can't update integers that pass by value. Uh, uh, it's, it's in the status parameter. So, so the point is the status. So, so this is perfectly reasonable assumption, especially if you're a Fortran programmer, uh, because it could update that value, um, but it doesn't. 
it's, it's in the status parameter. So remember, the status has a number of fields, status.mpi tag or status, status MPI tag is the tag of the incoming message which you need if you wildcard it. Status MPI source is the source of the incoming message which you need if you wildcard it. The size of the incoming message is not stored in the status, but you can, <coughs> but you can pass the status to a helper <coughs> function and say, how many integers were there in that message that came in? So you have to pass the status to, to, to a help front for them to get count. You can think of that being true for two reasons. First of all, you can think, well, probably MPI only knows how many bytes came in. Got 12 bytes. So you want, if you uh, say 16 bytes, you could ask MPI how many integers were back. You could say it was four, how many double position numbers two. Actually, it's not quite that. It's a technical question, but actually, um, message matching in MPI is not quite as simple as you might think. So um, if I if I define a contiguous the simplest derived data has a contiguous type which has maybe four elements. So I could I could I, I could I could define a contiguous type which was four integers. Okay. If I send if I do an MPI send of four integers, okay, let's call that contiguous type uh, block four. Okay. So I've got a single type which contains four integers. If I do an MPI send of four integers and I do an MPI receive of one block four, they match. That's legal, right? Because the contents are the same. Four integers, one. But they're actually different types, okay? I've sent four integers and I've received one block four. But they match because the, the contents of the message are four integers. So that means the size of the incoming message isn't defined. Because I said, I received the message. You could say, how many integers was it? It was four. How many block fours was it? It was one. Yeah, so, so actually, the size of the incoming message, what you could only, what you could, all you can really ask is how many, how many of this particular type were in that message. But it's interesting that, that message matching in MPI is not as straightforward as you might think. That um, if you use derived types, then you can play funny games. And if you think about it, you could even send a block of four integers and receive it into a vector. So you can send a contiguous block and receive it as a strided pattern, or send a strided pattern. Receive it. You can play lots of games as long as the you know if you send six integers, then I I think of the messages in flight being packed, and that's probably what really happens. Then I packs them up into a block, and in flight, the message doesn't know what it is. It just knows it's four integers. Okay, and but then when it's received, it can be received as one block four or, or a strided pattern or place. So the final one is. This one, this is, it's only in C, apologies for the report number, but hopefully it's fairly obvious what you're doing. What's the output of this MPI delay process is, so what's happening is the even process is if rank percent two, that's mod in proportion, if mod rank two is zero, the even process are calling an all reduce of the rank, and they're putting the answer in even sum, and it's one int, and, it's, and then it's printing it out, and the odd process is they're doing an all reduce of, the, of their ranks, but they're sticking the answer in the odd sum. So that the even processes are calling on reduce and sticking the answer in even sum, and the odd processes are calling on reduce and sticking the answer in odd sum, and they're printing it out. And then the question is, what's the answer? This is the closest I have to a trick question. It is there for a reason. It appears that this code is trying to, the even processes are adding up the even numbers, the odd processes are adding up the odd numbers. But actually, the correct answer is even sum equals 28, odd sum equals 28. So, so, so someone who answered this, why is it this? Why is it B and not C? Yes. So what's happening, this is quite subtle, but every, you're doing it with MPI com world, OK? So, 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 so collective operations have to be collective across a communicator. So, for this to work, everybody has to call this routine. If everybody doesn't call this routine, then, then it's going to block, okay? But it doesn't mean it has to be called from the same line. And if you think about it, MPI as a library has no idea where it's being called from, okay? All it's saying is, right, if, 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 if a process calls MPI all reduce, it goes into all reduce, and it says, right, I'm going to add these numbers up. What's the communicator? MPI com world. I'm going to have to wait for everybody to call this. So in fact... These processes and these processes are participating in the same all reduce. Okay? Each process is only making one call from this line or this line, but they're all doing the same all reduce. Okay? And if you so, so now if MPI were a compiler, you could have a different behavior. MPI could say, you maybe wouldn't even need MPI could say, look, 
all the processes, these are one re all reduced either another. Remember, MPI is a library, it can't possibly do that because, because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't know where the where it was pulled from. So because it's MPI com world, this this is a slightly a trick question. In fact, you're doing you're actually just adding up the ranks across the whole um, subset of all of course all the processes, which gives you 28. So, um, as I said, that is the closest thing I have to a trick question, but it is there for a reason, it's to show you that, you know, and this is probably what you want, you know, you, you, you know just, you, there are situations where, you know, that whereas, where, where, where different processes can be completely different functions, but they want to participate together, like a barrier, for example, They're, you know, if you're all doing different things, you all call a barrier, <coughs> that's what I have issues about barrier, you would call a barrier from different places, you want them all to match up, okay? So this is this is written to be to be misleading, but um, I mean, so it's deliberately misleading. So um, you know, the, the the natural answer is this, is, but it, it's, if you look carefully, it's actually this. Okay, so that was the last of my questions. I, when people are looking at the performance of their programs, the classic thing people do is they'll get some performance profile, they'll run it, and they'll see that their program is spending half its time in all reduce. So they immediately rush off to the system administrator and say. The all reduced function on this machine is broken, it's really slow. No, 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 no. What that means is you have loaded balance in your program. There's some process, you've got a really slow processor. And so basically, you know, n minus one of the processes are calling all reduced, and then they're waiting for something to come along. And that's often a symptom of load imbalance because you, you've not got so to do it. If you're spending lots of time in collective operations which synchronize, uh, most of them do, they don't have to, but most of them synchronize. Then you then um, then that's a sign of load imbalance, not a sign of you know oh you know this all reduces is really slow. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the case study. But I had a couple of quick lectures which are related to case study, but still in memory. So MPI, MPP memory. So something I have to get this on it very quickly. You may have noticed when we're talking about derived data types that if you. And we were saying that, for example, an a vector can be a, a, um, a 2D subset from a 2D array. But that, that relied on the, the array being a single block of memory. Now, if you do static array allocation in C and in, so this is, before trying this, this lecture is completely uh, moot. This what time program is going to just laugh at how complicated C is. But, but uh, because in Fortran, array, dynamic array allocation, and, it's pro, and in C, like, I'm sure it's been fixed. Today. In Fortran, dynamic array allocation is, is part of the language. So, um, you know, if you dynamic allocate array or static allocate array, allocate array it's, it's a zero consequence, they're the same. They're contiguous. A seven dimensional complex array is still a single block of memory, as you would expect. But because C is a bit more stupid, like it can't, you know, the POW function is a library function, the print function is a library function, um, um, it doesn't work that way. So, ah, uh, so. Four times, API drive type enables Friday data to be sent to receive no explicit copy and edits required. The Fortran programmers often say, why not use Fortran erasing points? Okay, sorry, this, I'm, I'm jumping ahead here. Uh, you know, if I want to send a non-contiguous block of memory, why don't I just use Fortran erasing points to select it? Well, there are some subtleties for non-blocky operations. Actually, when I said this is for the MSC students, I, you'll see on the website, I have a, a sort of an email which I'll go through which explains that. But this lecture is really about array layout. So, it, static array allocation is simple in Fortran and C. If I declare an array of size 4 by 4 in C or an array of size 4 by 4 in Fortran, just statically, the data is continuous in memory. And if I decide to draw it this way, I going along the J up the way, then um, we, we know all the compiler does is say, oh, David wants 16 array elements. So it gives me 16 array elements. But there is a mapping from the IJ, from the, from the multi-dimensional space to the linear space. And the mapping is prescribed, but it's just slightly unfortunate. Then C and Fortran is different. So in C, this is x00, this is x01, this is x02, this is x03. Whereas in Fortran, this is x11, this is x21, this is x31. So the way I've drawn it here with I going along the J up the way, in Fortran, the, um, the x slice is contiguous. Can see the y slice of the configure. If you want to draw these as matrices, then you can. Then it would be different. These would be. Um, uh, these would then be the, 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 the rows and the columns. I just draw them slightly differently. So there are there, so so fine. So the two nice things about static array allocation: a, you get a single block of memory, 
And B, in C, the array is synonymous with the address of the first element. So X and the address of X0 is zero synonymous, they're the same thing. Okay, that, that's nice. But then what most people do is that, but actually, but you know, in, in parallel programs, it's unfortunate you almost always want dynamic memory allocation. Why? Because you have a fixed problem size, but you want to run your program on multiple processes. And so by definition, the local problem size varies. So if I, if I, if I have a road of length 100, I have hash defined road length 100. If I run that on two processes, actually I want each process to, out, to allocate a road of size 50. If I run that on four, I want to allocate a size 25. So actually, you often end up in, 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 in do dynamic memory allocation in, in parallel programs simply because the local race size is dependent on the number of processes, which is not a, not a priori a compile time constant. So this is the classic thing people do. They say, well, I'll have, a, a re, I'll have X, but I'll call it float double star. I'll malloc an array of four pointers. Sorry, here they are. And then what I'll do is for each of these pointers, I'll malloc a row, which you might call a row, the way I draw it here. Um, you, you malloc these things. So you do, you do recursive mallocs, okay? But that gives you two problems. One is the data is non-contiguous because there is no mapping between that. So I can't use derived data types to pick out elements one, nine, one, five, nine, and thirteen because this, there's no there's no prescribed um, displacement between them. And secondly, x is not equal to the address of x zero zero. That's x. The address of x zero zero is there. It's that guy there. So we can't pass to any x to any input. So there's two problems here. We can't use regular templates of sketch data types because there's, and we can't pass x to an MPI routine. So we pass, if we do the MPI receive and we pass x, it would receive onto, and it would scrub over x and then all hell would break loose. So there's a problem here. So the way, to, so th there's ways to fix it, but I, there's, a, I've, on the website you'll see there's, there's a routine called Aralloc. And what, what Aralloc does is it does two things. So first of all, you can fix up this non-contiguous problem here by not doing multiple malloc, but doing one malloc of size 16, and then fudging these up by hand. You do x0 equals malloc of size 16, then you point x1 to here, you point x2 to here, no, x1 to there. You, you do that by hand. So Aralloc is a routine that A does that, it does a single malloc, no matter how many dimensions there are for the data, and just fudges up the points. So you still have you still have x, you still have four people with these dope x or whatever pointers, but the data is contiguous, okay? But Aralloc does something more. It actually makes the whole memory block contiguous. It even makes the pointers, no matter how many there are, and that is nice because then you can free it with a single free. Because one of the real problems about the, the, these, these mallocs and mallocs and mallocs is that you have to free them from the bottom up. You have to free this, then free that. Because if you free that, and then you go, I want to free, oh, I've just forgotten where these things are. So you have this horrible recursive free. So this Aralloc routine, this is magic. It looks a bit funny, but it looks funny because it's written for arbitrary numbers of dimensions. If you wrote a specific one for three dimensions, it would be quite easy to write for. But it does those two things. It has a single block of data, and it has all the pointers at the start, which means that you can free it with a C. You just do float double star x, it's float double star array alloc, size of float, two dimensions, it's four by four, and that's it, and you get it. The data is like this, but still, x is not equal to x, the address x zero zero. So if you want to send this data or receive this data with NPI, you have to be very careful not to send or receive x, because then it will scrub over all your pointers, but to pass. So uh, you must pass, and this, actually that's a typo, let's call something different on the, the website. You must pass the address map here and start to use it for MPI routines. In fact, if I'm careful, I always use the address XI JSON, that's because this gives you the same answer whether they're, whether they're static or dynamically allocated. It gives you the address of that element. Now, it's a very weird thing in C that, you know, they've, they've overloaded this syntax, you know, because if you do Y, equals x of 2, 1, at least in my opinion, that can mean two completely different things. Okay, the syntax is overloaded. If that is a static array, it means x of, um, of uh, 2 times the leading dimension plus, you know, it's basically a single lookup into a block of memory. 
If that's a dynamic array, it's saying, it's say, right, look up the second pointer and then dereference the first element of that. They're totally different things, okay? In one case, it's saying, go to whatever the element is directly by, by, by index, by just adding up the indexes, the indices. And the other one, it's saying, take that one, dereference it to there, and dereference it to there, okay? Which are totally different operations, but they're overloaded in syntax, in my opinion. Some of you may have it, some of you don't. So, um, so, um, so anyway, so so I've, I've, there's there's an array called there's a, there's a routine called Aralloc on the website, which and a couple of uh, helpful examples that show you how to use it. And the other thing I wanted to show you was on the website. There's there's four tram programs. Apologies, it should really be a a lecture, but I've just done it. It was originally concocted as an, as an email, and I just stuck it as a text file. I'm not sure that I'm not getting the idea, but. Um, so, um, Fortran programmers also have an issue, and it's the normal issue with using Fortran, but Fortran is a bit too clever. Uh, there's a slightly subtle issue with mixing Fortran anti erase and tax with non blocky MPI communications. Consider this code, okay? So you can see the answer here, but allocate buff n, that's a malloc, call MPI ISN buff and deallocate buff, okay? Why is that code incorrect? Yeah. You do not know that this message has been sent until you do the wait. So if you've deallocated it, you've just deallocated it. MPI has gone, right, I'll send that later, and then you've just deallocated it, okay? So that's obvious, and hopefully that's, well, I may, I may, I've zoomed in a bit, and I've screwed up the information. This is not a correct piece of code, because there's no guarantee that this item will have completed for the deallocation of the okay? So, okay, so this looks, that's kind of, and this isn't, this actually isn't, um, this isn't a Fortran issue. You could have written malloc MPI ISN uh, free then. But is it, you probably wouldn't do that. You say, well, who would ever do that? Well, the problem is this code, real dimension MN array. I want to send the um, a whole a whole J slice. I want to send the, um, a whole slice, a halo region. And I say, well, I'm not going to use uh, type vectors, that's way too much problem. I'll just use just use array syntax. Call MPI IS and array. Okay, this isn't obviously wrong, but what the compiler is doing, this is a non-contiguous, because Fortran arrays are contiguous in the first dimension, not the second. This is a non-contiguous block of memory. Okay? And when you write a Fortran function, if you just write a Fortran function that expects a vector, you expect that vector to be a single block of memory. So when in in there are ways around this, but in, in the most simple implementation, what Fortran will do is it will say, well, the called function will expect a, a, a contiguous vector, so I'll give him one. I'll allocate a contiguous vector, I'll copy in, I'll call the routine, I'll copy out, and I'll deallocate. So for complicated array subsets, and Fortran will often just say, copy in, copy out. There is nothing wrong with copy in, copy out. Okay? It, it may be a slight overhead, but functionally, for a Fortran program, that's fine. Unfortunately, this is an illegal Fortran routine. This has side effects which last beyond. So, if, if, if this was MPI S send, it would be absolutely fine because everything will MPI receive any blocking operation where the function is complete on return. Copy and copy out is fine. The problem is there are side effects which persist beyond this. So, what the Fortran compiler is doing is something like this. And as we see, this is wrong because there's no guarantee that this is this is going to happen. So, as I said, normally this is safe for Fortran functions, but for this reason, it's not safe to pass Fortran array subsets to any non-blocky MPI operation. I receive is equally a problem, but I receive is, is even worse because with IS IS send, you might be lucky and the send might happen before the deallocate. With I receive, almost without doubt, you know, you're going to post the receive. Tell MPI this is where the memory is, and it's going to be deallocated straight away. And then when you do the receive, it goes into random memory. Your program crashes. So, uh, so, so for contiguous array sections, pass the starting array element rather than explicit subsection. Now, Fortran compilers are quite clever. If you do this, they will probably spot this is a contiguous array subsection and not do copy and copy out. But actually, it could do copy and copy out. So it's probably safer to do this. Just, just pretend you're in Fortran 77 lines. I know some of you are going to be bored in 77, but, um, but um, you know, just pass them. I know 
just pass the pointer. This is what this is doing. Yep. So well, that's, so the way it works with buffered send is you you allocate memory with a malloc. You see a four time that you're sorry. You allocate memory with a malloc. Then you you give it to MPI. Then can I buffer attach? Okay. So you tell it this is where you should buffer the messages. That's where you tell MPI. If you don't do it on each B send, it's a setup call. You say, yeah. I'm going to do some vSense in this program. Please buffer them in this array. So you do MPI, you do malloc, then MPI buffer attach. And you're supposed to leave that memory. If you want to free it, you're supposed to do MPI buffer detach. And that will, MPI can then do it cleanly. It will then wait until it's free, and then you can free it. But if you just MPI, if you do malloc, MPI buffer attach, then free, then they're all hell break loose because it thinks it's got access to space that doesn't. But it's because there's a, I didn't cover it, but there's a detach which allows MPI to save play. It may take a long time, because it's going to have to wait for all the buffer, but the, the, the right thing is to do a detach. In fact, what you do is you do MPI buffer attach at the start of your program. Some people have this model where they do MPI buffer attach, malloc MPI buffer attach, B send, buffer detached, free. That's just pointless. That's not the way it works. You're supposed to do MPI buffer attach at line one. Run for ten hours and then MPI buffer detach at the bottom. It's the, you know, the non-contiguous array set should do one of the following: define an appropriate vector drive type. That's why I would recommend. So do you specify a call type, or you can do an explicit copy in and copy out. But if you do it, if you do an explicit copy in and copy out, of course you have control over when you free the buffer. So you can do allocate temporary buffer, copy in, MPI IS send. Wait, copy out, free. How, having said that, I would recommend using derived types here. Now, this is only an issue for non-blocking operations. For blocking operations, send, receive, send, receive, <coughs> be send, delete, receive, if it's got I in it. So people often say this is a Fortran problem. It's not specific to Fortran. It only, it's, only, the only, it's, a, it's a general issue with, 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 with MPI because you have, you have Function calls which return but have long term side effects. Now, there's all complicated syntax now in MPI. You can <laughs> declare functions. Are they asynchronous or something? There's all this machinery, but to be honest, I think you should just be aware of the problem. This C code has exactly the only point is it, arri it arises in a subtle way in Fortran. This C, this C program has exactly the same issue. Why is that? Buff goes out of scope, so buff is so. This is malloc buff. This is free buff at the bottom. You know, buff is free, so you'd have to make what would you have to do here? You'd have to make buff uh, static. Do I mean static? <coughs> or or higher scope or whatever? Then you'd have to make sure you didn't call this twice, though. You don't have to twice. Static has about 101 meanings, though, which I never understood. I remember that there was a statement that said uh, it wouldn't be a new it wouldn't be a new it wouldn't be a new version of the C standard unless it had a new definition for, for, for the keyword static. So, I, so I, the one I like is where's that little bit? There was a I know it's messy to use your fingers to look. There was a so I didn't understand this for years as a C pro when I was now if you have you have a function. And you do static x, okay? Static x, sorry. Why is that different from from in, how does that differ from index? Static index. You can't see it anywhere else. The location is no, because it's it's all because it's all it's only ever this is in the function, so it's scope within the function. So that means so, so you're right you're right, but this for the other use of static. So if you the difference between in-text and static in-text is this is persistent within the function. So you can remember it. Okay? So if you call it, it will remember it. If you do int x, if you do static int x outside a function, int x is always is still in text is persistent, okay? Because C has this bizarre concept of file scope. You can define variables in this weird hyperspace. I never want to like from no man's land. You're allowed to put variables here. So in text is already persistent. So what's the difference between so what's the difference between in text and static in text when it's and you just said it? 
It's that index x is global across the whole program. The static index means that x is global. It is only its final scope, which is bizarre because that's a static. That's that's not a. But it's like C++. I mean, C++ I/O is the weirdest thing in the world. C plus IO is done with batch. They've overloaded the bit shift operator to mean IO. I mean, really? Just because it looks like a, oh, that looks like, that looks like standard. Oh, that, that, that oh, that, yeah, it's just, it's just hijacked. They just hijacked the keyword and made it, it's just like C plus plus IO. They just hijacked the keyword. So, you can have a static code where it happens once it's done. It's seen outside of the scope. Yeah, you can always cheat. You, yes, so yes, you can always do that. But Chris, if you want to make, are you guaranteed that the, the value of that is not guaranteed to be the same? Just the location is never guaranteed. I, so you're right. You, it's like when if you do open MP, people talk about private data, and they could say, well, you say private data is private to a thread. Could I not take the point to the end? And you could do that. But I'm sure it's not guaranteed because I'm sure there'll be statements in the standard about. Segmented memory spaces, but this, you know, the address may only be valid, and that there'll be weird virtual. I don't know, but yes, I bet, I absolutely bet you. In practice, you could, you could take the pointer and, and give it to somebody. It's like saying, I mean, you can always do these things. You can always do. That's why Fortran has problems with MPX. That's illegal in Fortran. You can't take the address of something. Um, unless unless you mark something as being uh, isn't that true in, in, in C plus now can't you say that things are I'm not a C plus plus I know you can say that only one thing's allowed to have the address or something at once. Isn't that true? Yeah, there's something I'm not uh, Rupert's the first and last, not me. Anyway, so that so what I I've I've written on and I was just gonna do the case study now and then we can um, so the case study is the closest example I could get to something which was a um, which was complicated enough that it was interesting, simple enough that you could. So I'll actually go through basically if I just go through the um, what I've put on the exercises. We've seen the traffic bombing exercise sheet. That's the crib sheet. That's the MPP templates exercise sheet. We've covered this sample of solutions. The exercise sheet I have a good. Um, <laughs> That's the exercise sheet which is on. There's some source code which I give you. I give you some simple people. So my recommendation is is to write the case study exercise in serial and then parallelize it yourself. However, look, I know we're a bit compressed for time, so I've given out I've given out all the solutions, but I've given out serial solutions that you might choose to parallelize. I've given out parallel solutions if you want to look at them. This is the MPP Aralloc code, which I talked about. I actually, I've given you serial and parallel solutions to the traffic model, which I talked about on day one, this out of interest. But I'll go through the, there's a very short lecture associated with this. So we're going to do a very simple uh, domain decoupling to MPI code. What we're going to do, my domain decoupling, I start with a bigger array, and this is going to be an image, it's going to be a picture, and we're going to process it. But just, we're actually going to use exactly the same approach as the as the traffic model. We're going to say we've got a big array and we're going to split it up between processes. And the reason it's the same as the traffic model, is that although it's a 2D array, for simplicity we're going to split it up into slices. So, so, so the processes are in a line. We don't have a grid of processes, we have a line of processes. And that makes the code fantastically simpler for a whole number of reasons. Then we're going to assign the pieces to processors, 0, 1, and 2. Uh, again, I should say processes here. I'm a bit lax about saying processes or processors. That's because in MPI, in parallel program, we almost always run the same number of processes as processors. We have 24 cores on a, on a CPU, we run 24 processes. They're actually different things. But, um, and then we're going to do halo swapping, and I'll explain why, just like the traffic model. And so we just like in the traffic model, we use halos to deal with the interaction. So the point is, this 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 processor processor two, because we'll see that the update rule requires re, re, um, relies on the nearest neighbors, it can't update these pixels because they depend on pixels which it doesn't own. So process one sends these pixels to process two, and the only difference between this and the traffic model is in the traffic model we're sending a single element, but in two D 
we send a complete slice, which is a lot more realistic. So the entire slice of this data. Now, you could do this differently. You could say, each time I want an element, I'll request it. I can say, can I have element x7, can I have x8? But that's not, the, the efficient thing is to say, send a small number of large messages, say, for the next iteration, what data does everyone need? Processor to meet all that information, but send it to one. So there's actually three regions here, as there are in the traffic model. There's an inner region which can be which can be updated independent of the of the neighbors. There's a boundary region which is that which you cannot update, and there's also the, the data you need to send to your neighbors. And there's a halo region which is the data you receive from your neighbors. So there's a core there's kind of a core boundary halo, and this is kind of standard in any kind of boundary swapping code. You'll have a core which can be updated independent of the process. You'll have a boundary which is both the data that you cannot update and the data you need to send to other people, and a halo, which is a buffer temporary region for what other people's boundary data could come in. So what we're going to do, it doesn't show up very well here, it shows up better on your screens, is we're going to edge detection. And what I'm going to do, and I'm going to take a picture, this is Mel Gibson being William Wallace, who I was did, it's very popular in Scotland. He did one of the most popular things you can do in Scotland, which is kill lots of English people. Um, <laughs> that was, uh, 1492, was it? But then he got his comeuppance. I've not actually seen that film, but he came to a grisly end, didn't he? I mean, cut up in pieces. But anyway, I'm going to do edge detection on this. I'm, I'm going to do it in a very simple way. I'm going to take the difference between each pixel and its four neighbors, and, and it, the average of its four neighbors. Okay? So I'm going to replace, I'm going to, I'm going to say the edge value is the difference between the value of a pixel and the, and the average of its four neighbors. So if a pixel is equal to the average of its four neighbors, then nothing's changing. It's just a flat plane and you get zero. If a pixel is different from the average of its four neighbors, you get a, a non-zero value. You have to mod it to know whatever, but you get a non-zero value. And actually just comparing a pixel to the average of its four neighbors, you'll see, you get actually, that's really not a bad edge detection. What is interesting, well I think is interesting, is if I go, I'll go to the website to show you this. If I look at the, um, where is it? Here's the next issue. I don't know if it shows up here, but if we zoom in. So I don't actually give you this image, because about quite early on when I was running this course, someone said to me, have you got copyright that image? And I was like, oh, of course not. <coughs> so I don't actually give you this out. But can anyone, I don't know if it's going to show up, it's showing up on my screen. Can anyone see something funny about that image? Yeah, you should be able to see. What can you see on that image? A grid. A grid. So I thought I made a mistake. But then someone said, no, 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 no. Yes. So I just downloaded off this web like everyone does. And it's a JPEG, which is image compression. And the way JPEG works is it just does Fourier transforms and throws away the high frequency. But it does Fourier transforms on little blocks. And you, prob you can't really see on the left-hand image there are any artifacts. But of course, it's the lot. It's a loss in compression. So you get you get errors at the edges because you know you get truncation errors, which are particularly effective at the edges. So you can actually see, and this is the kind of thing that people do. Um, there are companies that a lot of people fake accidents now. They, they they Photoshop a picture of their car with a big crack on the windscreen and make a claim. But by doing things like this, you you know if they if they'd, if they'd updated the JPEG, but, but, but then with a PNG or something, you can look at it and you can see, wait a second, you know. So, so people do this kind of thing to try and, or they do watermarks. That's other thing people do. People put water, you know, that, I could have written a watermark on the left saying, this is copyright of Warner Brothers, you know, you are breaking copyright or something. <laughs> and that would have appeared on the right. So but anyway, that, I thought that was quite interesting. I thought I'd made a mistake, but it, it wasn't. So we could go from there to there. However, it's just not worth it. What we would do is we read that image into a single process. We would draw cast it, sorry, scatter it to all the other processes. They're going to do an image reconstruction, which is a single pass of the array. Sorry, they're going to do an image uh, edge detection. Apologies. Then they're going to. It's just not worth it. Uh, if you're going, to, you're going to scan through this array once to compute the edges, it's simply not worth parallelizing that calculation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the edges, and you have to reconstruct the image, and that turns out to require hundreds of iterations. And that's a much more interesting to do. In fact, so how do I compute the edges? I define the edge value to be the image left um, up, no, right up, left down minus four times given. So it's you know it's it's the difference between 
the image and the average is four neighbors <coughs> modulo a factor of four. Okay. So what we do is in in, in, in 2D, we pad the array with halos, and in the zero code, we set the halo values to y. So you might say I've defined the edge value as, as being the difference between an image pixel and its four neighbors. What do I do at the edges? Well, I do exactly what it shows here. I embed it in a sea of white. So off the end here is a, it, it, it is a, is a white pixel. So what I do is I surround the array with a big halo, even the serial code, and pad it with, with 255. Now, some of you may realize that that is just 2D. That's just the second derivative in 2D. So what I'm actually doing is I'm saying, I'm saying that edge is the second derivative of the image. I'm saying edge is grad squared image. So that, that, that's natural, because if, if the image values are flat or linearly increasing, that's not an edge. But if there's a curvature, then it looks like an edge. So I'm actually doing, this doesn't matter if you don't follow this, but I'm actually saying edge equals, I'm doing edge equals grad squared image. So I want you to solve grad squared image equals edge. I want to solve the Poisson equation or resistor. I want you to solve the Poisson equation where I give you edge and you have to reconstruct the image. And it's not obvious, but if you iteratively apply this formula, the new, which is just like the traffic model, the new value is dependent on the old value of, of the neighbors. If you do new ij as a quarter old to the left, to the right, sorry, to the right, up, to the left, down, minus edge, I if you repeat that many times, then you get the right answer. This is a very this is called the Jacobi algorithm. It's incredibly it's, it's, it's the most naive algorithm you can imagine, but it works. And the point is in parallel, we must update the halo values from neighbors every iteration because on iteration, the next iteration, the halo values have changed. And so there's a there's, there's, there's a communication, halo swapping, computation, communication. And, I could get you to parallelize the edge detection algorithm to go from the image to the edge, but that you'll never see any speed up there because it's just dominating. But going from the edge to the image is nice. If you think of it as a slightly fake um, um, image processing um, example, then hopefully it makes sense. But also, physicists, 95% of physicists spend all their time solving grad squared image because that's what everyone does. Grad squared gravity equals mass. Grad squared. Um, Grad squared something or something. It's, 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 quite, it's quite embarrassing. It's quite embarrassing how many, how many, how many programs. You know, I, I would say more than fifty percent of parallel programs are solving this in some in some format. Okay, so QCD is just this up, down, left, right, minus. But it's not four times because it's four dimensions. So it's up, down, left, right, minus sixty, whatever it is in four dimensions. Time, time limit. I mean, it's it's it is. Somewhere anyway. So this is the diffusion equation of whatever you want to call it. So uh, domain decomposition, there's different choices in CN Fortran. It's best for two reasons. It's best decomposed in C, decomposed in now again I draw I draw the indices I going along, J going up the way. Um, so in C, you want to you want to in, in C you want to split it in the I dimension, and in Fortran you want to split it in the J dimension, which the way I've drawn it corresponds to vertical and horizontal slices. There are two reasons why you want to make these two cho these choices. One is neither are obvious, but one's can I kind of think why why these are the best choice? You can do it the opposite way, but it causes no end of pain. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in if you do it this way, the halo is a single block of data, so you can, you can send it with a single send and receive it to receive. You don't have to mess around with derived data types and stuff. There's another reason which might not be obvious why this is useful. It means that when you do, it means that what, what we're going to do is we're going to read the data in, the whole image in to, let's say, rank zero, and then we're going to send it out to the different ranks. If we use this decomposition, then the first, if this whole array sits on rank zero, then the first quarter of the array as a linear block of memory is for rank zero. The next quarter is for rank one. The next quarter is for rank two. That means we can send it out with a scatter and receive it with a gather. If I did the opposite decomposition, the data would be all horribly split up all over the place. So the two reasons why you should do this are, A, it makes the halo swapping, which is the, which is the most important one, it makes halo swapping easy, but B, it allows you to do the I.O.
with a scatter and a gather, which may not be obvious. Um, so I give you more detailed principle instructions, a tarball in CO Fortran. I just give you IO routines with some input files, but I have given you a template serial code, which you might want to. There's a Fortran one, there's a C1, which illustrates the static and dynamic array allocation. I would advise you write the serial code yourself, but I appreciate the type of time, so you can start from the serial code that I provided you. It's up to you. Um, <coughs> check the serial code works. The first thing is distribute the work onto the processes and do separate <coughs> instructions. So that's why I like image processing. So what would you think would happen if you if you decompose the array like this and do separate image reconstructions here and then gather it back? Don't do any halo swapping, okay? What do you think you see? It's a good debugging exercise. <coughs> Sorry? Nice. Yes. You, what, what you will see is you will see a pretty good picture, but you will actually see the process, the boundaries of this, as horizontal or vertical line. But that shows you you've done the I.O. correctly. And it shows you, and then the next thing is to um, get the halo exchange to a single reconstruction and further suggestions to the instruction sheet. And this, this is a slightly contrived example. It is contrived in the sense that the answer in parallel should be bit identical to the answer in zero. That is almost never achievable in the real program. But in a simple program like this, you should get absolutely exactly the same answer in this parallel and serial. Now you're actually, of course, when we write out the JPEG, the, 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 the image form I've been using is, is just is, is just not two five five values, so it's already been rounded. But actually, if you were to dump the floating point values, you should get identical values in serial and Fortran. It's serial and parallel, etc., which is not generally true, but that it, it's. It's quite useful to say that. Sorry, can you just make explicit why it's not generally true? Say that again? Can you just make explicit why it's not true? Because in almost all real programs, um, you take global sums, and which then um, which you then use on the next iteration. So if you were if you were solving this, I don't know if you've done linear solving, you're solving this with like a, a, a real algorithm like conjugate gradient. You have to take dot products of vectors, which involves um, global accumulation. So those dot products, which are accumulated across the process, will, will vary very slightly. So, 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 so any time you do a global operation, summing up a value across process, you will get a slightly different value in serial and parallel. And if it's just a diagnostic, that doesn't matter. But and, and here it's just a diagnostic. But in a real program, you use those values on the next iteration. So you can look up any real linear solver, not the Jacobi iteration. It will say, you know, you take dot products of vectors, and they will vary slightly. Some people insist on bit reproducing in parallel programs, notably the climate modeling community. Um, I that is incredibly difficult to. What it means is you actually have to do what you. What it really means is you do the serial calculation in parallel, in the sense that even when you do the serial sum, you you do it. Kind of hard to explain, but I I I don't see any reason for that. I appreciate it gives them some feeling of comfort that they run the program on one processor and they get the same answer for the weather tomorrow than they run on hundred processors. But then the weather's a chaotic process, so you don't so it's meaningless, in my opinion. I, I know they disagree, but I think I think bit reach reproducibility is a for debugging, it's nice. It, 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 it's nice. It would be nice to be able to all run your code in a mode where it was bit reproducible, which would make debugging easier, because you know if there's a difference, then it's a bug, not a rounding error. However, for real production runs, bit reproducibility is 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 um, is not. You know, if, if you get different answers by changing one bit, then you have an unstable calculation. That's you know, that, that's the way they run. Have to whittle on a bit, but uh, yeah. So, but here, so for example, if you look at the extended examples, here I just say run for fixed number of iterations. But in reality, you should stop after a certain tolerance. So you should stop when stop when the image when the image stops changing. You finished, okay? So you compare the new image to the old image. If they're almost the same, you stop. The obvious thing to do is to take the sum of the squares of the differences of all the pixels, the root mean square difference. But I don't use that because that's a global value which is subject to rounding errors. So the serial code might run for 9,527 iterations and the parallel run for 9,528 <laughs> by one. 
what I use is the maximum difference. And of course, that's not subject to random inversion. The maximum difference is the maximum difference. It doesn't matter who got it. So if you, if you see my stopping criteria is based on the maximum change, not the average change, which again is slightly contrived, but it's deliberately done to make the, the code fit be producible. So I've gone on a bit more with so are there any questions then? So so the, uh, the, the the sheet is quite explicit. Um, it makes various suggestions like the pseudocode of the sheet is kind of Fortran and C neutral. The reason it's Fortran and C neutral is that I advise the Fortran programmers to, to, to define their arrays to start at zero and finish at n plus one. So the real data is one to n, the boundaries are not n plus one, which is the same as the C code. And C, if you define array, a, a array of size n plus two, the halos are not n plus one, and the real data is one to n. So that, so, so it only, there's only a couple of cases where my pseudocode differs from C and Fortran. That does rely on you defining the arrays in the way I suggest. If you don't, that's fine, but you'll, you'll have to work out the index manipulation for yourself. So what we'll do now is we'll just take a coffee break um, and the whole of the next section will be the case study. And then first thing after this afternoon, after the, tea, the lunch break, we'll give a short lecture on MPI design issues, which are just general thoughts and comments on writing the MPI program. And then we'll go back to the case study. And I think we're dying to finish at four.